So on today's show, um, we have a cautionary tale to discuss with you. Yes, we do. And then at 1.30, I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to call the Zachary James, who is a breakout opera star at the Met. And some of you have messaged me like, oh my God, I just saw him. Um, at the Met. So it's a really, really full day. So we just want to talk a little about, um, but I really want Kevin on camera. I'm coming. Um, about a recent, uh, a lot of you guys have been following us, whether it's my YouTube, whether it's my Facebook, whether it's my Insta, whether it's Kevin's YouTube or Kevin's Facebook. So basically the bottom line is we had an actor come in who we had worked with about two years ago, right, Kev? Mm -hmm. In Spring Awakening. Good actor. You know, uh, it was a teen production. Um... Show was great. I think it's one of our best works together. Yes. Wouldn't you say? And this said actor uh, went off to go to school, as they do. And suddenly we started seeing things appearing online that this actor was appearing in. Like overnight success. Overnight success. On four different movies. Yes. It was a Netflix series, a Netflix movie two major motion pictures, and then suddenly booked the lead in a Broadway show. Yes. Um, the unfortunate truth is <laughs> none of that was true. I ended up getting a phone call New Year's Day from a source, which I am unfortunately not able to disclose, that um, it was most likely fabricated. The story was fabricated. Um, at this point, allegedly fabricated. Yes. You know, um, at this point we had already had this young actor in the studio. Um, and we, in we went out for coffee, we interviewed him, we hung out for a little bit. So yes, allegedly the tale may not be true. Um, would you like to say anything? We could say who it is, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah, we're, we're, everybody we're, knows. Yeah. So it was Thomas Fetner. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, why I say that, that this is a cautionary tale is because I've had, I want to say 2018 and 2019, um, man, I kind of call that my university education because my eyes have been open to A, human beings, human nature, and I have to remember uh, not to think that everyone thinks like me or behaves like me. So basically what happened is this firestorm started um, with a lot of self-published articles. Now, these self-publishing sites are great. They're great if you want to get... Uh, you know, like Broad Broadway World, you know, I use it. I update my Broadway World with stuff. But here, there's a, there's a downside to like mm -hmm. a site like that because mm -hmm. I know for me, I've had some like... Um, like, I've had some people on there, like, if I look under my news on Broadway World, mm -hmm. like, there's shows that I've never been cast in that says I'm cast in. So, right. So, I, I don't have direct control over the links and all that stuff, but, you know, so so things like Broadway World, Thomas ha said that he's, he's cast in Wicked as Fierro, and a lot of things just surfaced that were not uh, accurate, and we're doing damage control. Right. To just try to... Reassure our listeners that we do our due diligence. We do do our due, due diligence. And I am taking responsibility for myself because um, I do love all our ca all my students, all my cast members, anyone that's come through working with me. Um, as an arts educator, I'm very excited for their success. And they tell me what they're doing or they post on Instagram. And they know, and I know that they can attest, I'm always so proud of all of them. We have students that are traveling the world. We have students that are becoming writers, that are writing their own plays. We have students that have moved into the city, and they're doing new works in the city. So it, it, for me, it doesn't matter if you're on the Broadway or in a movie or if you're starting out and you're like, hey, I want to become a playwright. I'm going to be happy for you regardless. So, yes. So what happened was these self-publishing sites kind of created a firestorm. We were not the only ones that kind of um, glommed onto it. There were several, several other sources. Um, now they've a lot of these things have been pulled off of the Internet. Yeah. So you'll see because Google, you know, you're allowed to go on Google and search something, mm -hmm. but it's still in Google's index for quite some time. So you'll click on a link that says Tom Fetner in, you know, Spy versus Spy. And it'll say the link is dead, mostly because... 
they've now retracted most of their stuff because, you know, it's not accurate. It's not accurate. And yeah, so and in a world of fake news, this is something even aside from what we had to deal with this past week, really know your news source when you're sharing anything on social media, whether it's about politics, whether it's about art. I did not do my homework. I was sloppy and I was lazy because I wanted it to be true for this person because that's just how I am. So I was, I looked past some of those things blindly. I will absolutely take responsibility for that and something that's never going to happen again. Um, but it was so, I mean, it's not your fault. It was so easy to like all the, there was so much information supporting these claims. And so it was kind of hard to yeah. suss through it. And then yeah. as, as stuff started coming out, you know, I went to the bottom of one of the articles and it said the source was this casting agency in Georgia. Mm-hmm. And I called them and they had no idea who the hell I was talking about. And that's when we started to realize things were starting to unravel. I, I We also got an email um, from another source who I cannot... Um, mention saying the same things that all this stuff was untrue and they actually said you need to do your homework better and I kind of felt um, like shit <laughs> I'm not gonna lie um, and this has been a little I mean Kevin knows I have definitely been blaming myself a little bit because this is this is a first for me we've interviewed so many wonderful artists and people and doctors and authors I mean uh, entrepreneurs um this is this is a, a you know a first for me, and I think I was definitely a little a little shaken. I was like a little um, Kevin knows a little emotional about it actually. Yeah, you you hel- she held on to it for quite some time, and we had to have a talk. <laughs> yes, I it was something that I knew about for a long time that I wasn't able to um, reveal. Uh, because I was I, w- I was told not to. And, um, you know, and then I would run into people and I'd be so paranoid. People that knew this person that they were going to talk about it. So it became like um, I very much internalized it and owned the responsibility. So aside from knowing your news sources, and again, Broadway World is great. I use Broadway World when I'm promoting a show. Broadway World's great. All these sites are great. But again, you have to kind of, you know, be... Uh, aware of it um my second thing is don't be blinded by social media and even though we say we do have a question and we will get to you in one second aiden um i have an answer for him yes um one thing is that we live in a world of likes and followers and prestige so i think that we now the pendulum has swung very far one way into um, what is social media, what is reality, what is not reality. So I was blinded. I was blinded by, because then you would go on this person's social media and I'm like, wow, you're getting like 12,000 likes on a picture. But you know what? You And anything could be manipulated. So don't get hung up on someone's prestige. It doesn't matter online. It is who they are. It is who the core person of that person is. It doesn't matter. Do not get hung up on likes. Do not get hung up. And Kevin knows how I feel about a blue check, <laughs> a blue check mark because deep down it doesn't matter. And to spend so much time creating this false sense of self, false sense internet. of reality, to my students, to anyone that's going to work with me, has worked with me, put in the work. If you want to do this for a living, you got to enjoy the journey. And you know what? This business ebbs and flows. It doesn't matter how old yeah, you, you are. You can't fake your way into the business. It's no. Just, you got to put in your work. So there's a question. What do you... Yeah, but with Aiden to answer uh, what he said. So well, even her, even Lauren and I during the day when Tom was interviewing with us, we kind of had some kind of like feeling like he's he's not behaving as somebody that got these roles. He seemed kind of like shy and pulled in and and not really like So we knew we felt something was awkward, but maybe he was just excited. So, you know, we didn't see it at that point as him lying to us. Now we know. Mm-hmm. But um you know, I don't I don't take it personal. I just I it, No, it wasn't you know, and and that's what I'm coming to grips with. Um I'm not taking it personal because it doesn't matter if it was me or like Joe Smith. It doesn't matter who was sitting here. You can't. You can't take it. You know. Um, So there was another question. Oh, you can't blame yourself. Yeah, but yeah, but I am responsible. 
I do have to accept as a, journalist. as a journalist, as an interviewer, I do have to be a little responsible for being sloppy, for being sloppy. But it's because I want because I wanted to believe it. Um, how did you feel after all the responses from people who knew him and Supported. the hard? In coming out about it. Yeah. You, you know, we kind of... We knew for a while. Like, I've been doing homework and screenshots. Well, and I called I, him I, right away. I talked I was like, to him actually one on... Well, he didn't talk back, mm -hmm. but I, I messaged him and, and asked Hi, him everyone. why he's not doing all these movies, and he just started pulling <laughs> pulling back. So it's like, okay. So, yeah, it was... um, it, it, uh, It's an odd feeling. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I pulled back a little bit from... So I'm starting to get my groove back a little bit. But I had uh, it, it was an interesting way because it was New Year's Day, so it was like 2020, and I get this phone call. Um, it it was um, I was it w I was shaken. When you hire someone that you direct, you are putting trust in them. So I'm sure that adds to it. Well, that's the thing too. When I hire people, you're part of my family. You're part of my creative family, and I think that's the beauty of the arts is that we are vulnerable. Right. As artists, we're vulnerable. We could be sensitive and we do build a community with well, each people, other. We get vulnerable and, you know, yeah. it's like even, so, even the strongest people have their their moments of, you know, you could sneak in there. But Chris says, do you know if Tom is using these fake gigs in order to gain? Exp I have no idea. Honestly, why he did I don't know. I His did. girlfriend was in on it, too. She well, said she. Well, that well, well that's we don't allegedly. Know. We don't know. We don't know. I have we don't to say want, allegedly. So, we don't yeah. know. We don't but, know. We don't want to implicate anyone else. But I have information from people that know them, that have talked to them, that are friends with them on Facebook. That she also stated she was. Uh, but this isn't about signed. her. No. This isn't about her. No, but, and maybe she is. We don't know anything about right, that. Right, but she's pulled it back since too. So it's like they've, oh, they've hi, disappeared Ram. everything. Hi, Alan. Yeah, and 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 like. And I know Kevin got a lot of flack for 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 saying that he yeah, was. I'm very outspoken. So um, I, for publicly shaming, but uh, that's first but of all, that's not, not our. Um, I was actually a little sad. I actually had a couple moments where I cried over this uh, to myself. I am a mother. Hi, Philip. Hi, guys. I I am a mom. I do. I have four children, um, and this. This was hard for me. And I was even talking to a friend on Tuesday night. And it was funny how I kept on the conversation. I'm like, I feel so bad. He goes, you need to stop feeling bad because you've done nothing wrong. Um, this, was, this was a huge life lesson. And it's one thing that I've always taught my students is there's no reason to lie. There's no reason to lie. And the energy that you put into the dishonesty, you may as well put that work into honing your craft. So those five minutes that you're going to spend on social media and, and, and do whatever, why don't you maybe go find a new monologue to work on? Why don't you maybe, um, I don't know, go meet up with someone and be like, you know, I'm feeling, you know, I, I need a little artist community. I don't know. I just, um, it's, it, for me, it's still a very, very, weird feeling i'm not gonna lie it's probably gonna take me a little while to get over it but he might you know he might not have lied consciously he might honestly you know it if you got a psychologist in here they might say that it might be a pathology or something i'm not judging the guy but it's or you not, know what it could have been a joke we don't know we, we don't, don't know. know we don't know because he really we even reached out to him to see if I he could come out. in and talk to us today about it i did reach out to him um and you know he was great in our show. I mean, he was, he was, I mean, I he have no, <laughs> he was our lead. So, I mean, I, 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 talented, talented guy. So, um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm reading, uh, it's, he's currently guy. relying on his friends that he still is cast in wicked and that it was just pushed back. Yeah. I, I have a friend that knows him. We have a friend that knows him too and talks to him religiously and, they have um, also said, <laughs> like, he keeps saying all his shit's being pushed back. I'm like, yes, into nothing. You know. Because it doesn't exist. But, you know, um, so we, uh, Nicole, some people lie so much that they start. Well, and that's the thing, and it's so funny, and this is what I tell my children. I always tell my children, um, and we'll have a conversation, especially because I ha I, now I have a teenager. I said, you know, you don't want to lie, or you don't want to be dishonest. 
because it's hard to keep up with a lie. The truth is much easy to much easier to remember. And you spend way too much time. But again, I don't know if he consciously lied, mm -hmm. like if he knew he was doing it or if he assumed the reality. Because I know there was a show that... Hi, John. He was cast in as an ensemble member back in 2017 in Violet, and he claimed that he was Monty. But the guy who actually played Monty disproved that. I mean, basically, our phones were blowing up that whole entire day. Um, our, so we were getting a lot of... Um, you know, and I don't want to reveal, pe you know, it's it's not worth it. We're not naming names of who we who contacted, uh -uh. contacted and us, we're honestly, we know. And, and we also decided we're like, after today, after we do this retraction, we're not talking about it anymore. We're, no, we're done. We're, we're moving past it. We'll probably share an article if it comes out in the newspaper. Just if to it be does. Like, oh, but, here we go. Um, yeah. So I do. I hope that you'll still follow our show. Um, of course. I they, definitely you hear that opening song. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> because I do. The reason why we started Chew the Scene and Danny's not here um, is because I wanted to give a voice to artists, to artists that are up and coming, to artists that are still hustling in the business, to artists that um, maybe are starting a new, uh, a, a new chapter in their life. But I've talked to doctors, platform. I've talked to lawyers, and it's a gr and so that's why we're still here and we're still going to go strong about it. And what time is it? It's 28. You so probably get on that. we are, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you'll stick around because I have the Zachary James calling in to, um, well, I'm going to call him, but we're going to put him on the air. And I'm so excited. So I've been trying to set up this interview for a long time. Um, and, you know, really, you know, and I do really quick disclaimer, you know, I do the vetting. I mean, we don't, you know, it's three of us uh, on our team here. So when I have, you know, when, when I come across something, I'm the one that's doing the research. So I don't have like a team of people really like, you know, doing like the deep dive. I'm going to deep dive a little deeper now, even though I'm afraid of the water, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I want to be better to our listeners and I want you to be able to trust me. And I feel like I kind of let down um, no, you didn't. my listeners. No, by this. Tom's an idiot. He no, let down you said everyone. you weren't going to say that. Well, I said Tom's an idiot for doing it because he just ruined like all the... You know, the going to AMDA and graduate. I mean, there's so many things that could have come. In. But again, we don't know. I love psychology. This could be something where this, there's, there it might could be, more be a psychological reason like for it, not like a conscious effort to lie. It might be some, like an impulsive effort to lie. You don't know. Don't Super know. fan for life. Nicole, you are our girl. You are our number one girl. You want to start a fan? Hashtag. Oh, hashtag. hashtag. You want to start a fan club? Start a fan club, please. So anyway, to everyone that I've worked with in the past, you know I love you. You know I'm always supportive of you guys. And if I could come see a show or if I could come see something you're doing, I absolutely will. Come on our show. Come talk. We're here to support you. We want to be the voice for you. I'm so sorry for my gaffe. It will never happen again. I promise you. It, 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 Don't be fooled by social media likes. Don't be fooled by pictures. Don't be fooled by the number that people have on their Facebook the page. Check Don't be check by the blue check mark. Don't be fooled, okay? It doesn't matter if you if someone gets five thousand likes on a post and you get five. Do not your worth does not matter for that. That does not define who you are. Your social media is your persona. Who are you as a person? That is who matters. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks. Love watching you guys. Keep up the great work. Thanks for being true to the... Thank it's you so much, John. So I'm going to... Um, Kevin... Are you going to call? I'm going to give him a call. Onward and upward, guys. You know better. That's it, Melissa. Onward and upward. I'm ready to do this 2020. Kevin, why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing while I get Zach on the phone? Good. Zachary. Oh, my God. He's on the phone because I have to do the... Mm -hmm. Hi! I don't know what to talk about, but we'll find something, I'm sure. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm working on an original musical. Oh, yeah. I did a reading last week of my original musical, Abstinence, the musical. See, I'm never one of these people that likes to, you know, advertise myself and talk about myself. I hate that shit. I never can do that. Oh, anyway, um, but I, yeah, I have a video. I have a album for Abstinence I'm working on and stuff, and it's a fun show. And she's getting Zachary on the line. Hi, Zachary. Oh, thank God. Okay, good. I could stop. God help me. 
Landline? What is that? We're going to get you hooked up right now, um, and I'm going to introduce you, and I can't wait to get chatting. Perfect. Thank you. Will I reach from here? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Look at this. I'm using a landline, and I didn't even know how to turn it on, guys. That was crazy. I'm definitely a 21st century girl. I'm a 21st century, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I don't know math or numbers. Okay. Let me know, Kev. We're good. All right. So thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to our cautionary tale. And uh, I've been waiting for this for a long time, I think since before even the holiday. But we now welcome to the To the Scene Airwaves. Opera star, Zachary James. Hi, Zachary. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so it's funny because I was posting a lot about, you know, interviewing you. And I had so many friends that they've either seen you at the Met or they've worked with you in a reading. So it really just goes to show how small our community really is. Absolutely. So, um, Zachary, you just, and I'm going to so mispronounce the name of the opera, so I'm not even going to say it. Can you please tell everyone that you close to rave reviews to an opera at the Met? Um, can you tell us what opera that was? Yes, it was the Philip Glass opera Akhenaten. And, um, yeah, we enjoyed a totally sold out run at the Met. It was a really wonderful experience and so cool to see how uh, embraced the production was by critics and audience alike. Um, and I'm an opera girl. Did you know I grew up going to the opera with my godmother? Oh, I, no, that's cool. Yes, she has since passed. But I, um, yes, uh, Porgy and Bess, La Boheme I've seen. I've seen, I mean, the list goes on. So I love the opera. And I so appreciate the work that goes into it. But now you are not just an opera singer i think i read one uh, article that they say you, you they, they something whiplash because you go back and yeah. forth <laughs> yeah yeah so i began my career on broadway and uh, i did a few broadway shows before getting um full-time into opera and i've also done some tv and film work and yeah it's kind of crazy <laughs> so can you tell everyone um can you just uh, talk about a little bit of the broadway shows that you've done yeah, sure. So my first Broadway show was called Quorum Boy, and um, probably no one's heard of it because mm -hmm. it closed after a few weeks. It was a big flop. You no, know, um, actually, my college professor knows Quorum Boy. Dr. Chaffee, shout oh, out. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's a really, really cool show, and it was a beautiful production. It was just a very kind of saturated Broadway season, and we, very, we opened very late in the season, just a month before uh, Tony's came out. And so... Um, it was also a big hit in London, and they thought it would be a big hit here, but there was no kind of name recognition with the title. And in, in the UK, everyone knows what the Quorum Hospital is, and um, the book that it was based on was a very popular young adult novel. Um, so it was a big hit there, but here it was a tough sell. Um, so that closed quickly, but uh, then I was in the original cast of the Broadway revival of South Pacific at Lincoln Center, which was a big break for me, mm -hmm. and I did that show for about a year and a half, um, and we won, uh, I think, seven or eight Tony Awards, which was amazing, and um, <laughs> then uh, the following year, I played Lurch in the original cast of The Addams Family, which I did for about two and a half years between um, the out-of-town tryout in Chicago and two years on Broadway. And then when did you swing into opera? And, you know, um, and was this always something you were interested in? Because it is such a niche and it's such a, um, yeah. you know, a different audience even. Although I will say I do find some crossover now when you go to the opera. There is some Broadway oh, yeah. really appreciating the art of opera. So how did that start for you? Yeah, well, I'll start by saying, you know, we're all trying to tear down that wall between musical theater and opera and the Met has been really good about uh, bringing in Broadway actors um, to the opera scene. You know, Kelly O'Hara has done a couple things mm -hmm. with the Met now, and Danny Burstein and Betsy Wolf, and um, so everybody's out there fighting the good fight um, to <laughs> to say mm -hmm. that musical theater and opera are all just telling story on stage with music and in different ways. And there's definitely um, potential for a great crossover audience there. And a lot of artists are trying to do both. Um, for me, 
It actually was from the Adams family that I got into opera. The director of the Adams family, Salem McDermott, um, has a close relationship with Philip Glass, and he does a lot of his work. So they were working on a new opera called The Perfect American about Walt Disney, and they needed somebody with kind of um, uh, precise stage savvy and uh, who could handle choreography to do this role of a robot Abraham Lincoln at Disneyland. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> so I was asked to audition for Philip Glass, and he cast me as this cool animatronic Abraham Lincoln and we did the show in Madrid and London and Brisbane and it was a really wonderful experience and started um, an important relationship with Philip Glass for me that has um, led on to Akhenaten now four times and we'll do it again in the next couple of years um, so um, you know opera was always kind of in the back of my mind and people were planting seeds my voice teacher was instrumental in um, encouraging me to do opera um, and you know I was always interested in it it just honestly sounded like a lot of work yeah <laughs> yeah it is yeah. I mean even for the audience when I'm it there really is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is and there's just so much to learn and you know I got my degree in musical theater and you know that's where I started out and um, but the the intense study of languages and opera if you, if you want to do all sorts of opera and be diverse in what you're doing so if you want to do you know like i've done recently wagner and verdi and mozart and puccini but also philip glass and, and world premieres um there's a lot that you have to know and it's taken me you know i've been in opera full-time just about eight years now and it's taken me uh all that time i'm still learning new skills constantly with every production i do so um it is a lot of work, but I actually really enjoy the challenge, and it, it keeps me keeps me young. <laughs> well, and you know, I, I love that you brought up the other languages because yes, I mean a lot of these opera Italian, German, but to me, opera is another language, body language, yep. vocal language. Sure. So when you go back and forth, um, how do you do that transition when you're because you you do have a musical that you just announced yesterday that you are, have been cast in and it is cl it is close to it, I mean I would call it, it it has that opera feel to it but it is musical theater um, mm -hmm. can I say what I, I can say what it is right yeah 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 okay so you're going to be playing Sweeney and Sweeney Todd yeah. um, uh -huh. at, and uh, it's in Omaha I almost say it's Omaha Opera Opera Omaha. Yeah. Opera Omaha. So ha will you take some of your opera training with you uh, to do the role? It, it, you, it's, it's, like a, it's like you're going to have to blend two worlds, basically. Am I right? Or Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I try to take all my musical theater and acting training into opera. So I try to approach everything from the standpoint of being an actor first, but also inhabiting a character fully with my body, which we were taught to do in theater. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually find physical storytelling is crucially important in opera because of the language barrier. Mm -hmm. And even when we are singing in English, a lot of times it's not understandable over right. the orchestra and at the volume that we're singing. Mm -hmm. So sort of like ballet, um, physical storytelling becomes really important and inhabiting a character fully with your body and, and um, every gesture being at 100% and authentic is really important um, to make it accessible for an audience. Um, so Sweeney, you know, is sort of like an opera because it's almost fully sung, mm -hmm. and a lot of opera companies are doing it. And the thing about doing Sweeney with an opera company is we're not using mics, and it was originally written with for you know to use microphones. So yeah, it actually gets really intense really fast and it's suddenly like Sweeney is like doing Wagner you know yeah because it's a really it's like a very very dense orchestration and so there's really it becomes a full body Olympic workout <laughs> well and you brought up the microphones because you don't use microphones yeah. at the Met correct very rarely very rarely uh, and I don't think people realize yeah. that and I think that is what I love so much and especially growing up going to the opera, spending a lot of my life there, 
you you are literally relying on your voice. What are some exercises that you do as an opera singer to get that sound out? Is it different than anything with musical theater with the training? Um, you know, I'll say in musical theater, like if I'm doing a, a musical, I don't warm up that much. And with opera, I warm up a lot more because there's a lot that you can get away with with microphone singing. And there's more tender dynamics mm -hmm. that you can experiment with. Um, I do a solo show, a Broadway solo show um, that I've been doing all over the country about my time in New York and on Broadway. And I use a microphone for that. And it's actually a nice contrast to be able to go and sing you know, very lightly in falsetto <laughs> with a piano um, versus kind of screaming my face off with a ADP orchestra. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, with opera, you really have to, your entire body has to be warmed up and ready to go. And it's just more demanding. You know, I start warming up about at least two hours before wow. an operatic performance, whereas if I was doing a musical, I might start warming up maybe 15 minutes before. Right. So... So, um, and I'm sure you're, you're incredibly successful. You have all these dates coming up where you have performances. Um, what, it, like, what is a day in the life like for you? I mean, what do you, what do, you do on your off days? You know, where you don't have to uh, warm up. You know, I try to, I try to rest when I can, mm -hmm. um, but it really, there's always music to learn mm -hmm. and there's, um, you have to stay healthy and lead a very healthy lifestyle. So that's, that's kind of a full-time job. And, um, and getting rest when you can is really important as well because sometimes I live in Philadelphia and travel to New York a lot for work. So sometimes I'm getting up at 6 a.m., getting on a train, and getting home at midnight. So, you know, you, you really have to stay healthy and be vigilant about your lifestyle and um and there's not really days off <laughs> no. in a way because we're always practicing and always improving well and i love that you say that because that's what i i tell my students it, it you know you have to love the journey of theater you know i teach theater um and every day you need to do something towards your goal so even if it's something yeah. small, whether it's updating your website, whether it's making that phone call, you really, yep. it, it, it's it, because there's so many of us out there, um, not that we're, I don't necessarily believe in like, I mean, yes, there's minor competition, but yeah, you're always kind of honing your crap. You, I always say you want to be better than you were yesterday. You want to be a better yep. person, better performer than you were yesterday. So what can you do to make that happen? For sure. But now yeah. you... Because we're friends on Facebook, you did a little show at the Slipper Room. Can we talk about that? Sure. <laughs> I love those pictures. I actually filmed a TV show there, so I love that room. I was in a show that oh, filmed yeah. in the Slipper Room, and it's a fabulous little room in New York City. So it's a um, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because those pictures were amazing, and I I wish I could have well, gone. Thanks. Yeah, so it was a um, kind of a burlesque take on Wagner's Ring Cycle, and um, I just got a group of artists together that I really love to work with, and we presented kind of an irreverent but loving look at uh, specifically Das Rheingold, the Wagner um, opera that starts the Ring Cycle, mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of Valkyrie as well. Um, but it was a lot of fun um, and kind of... Um, totally wild and crazy <laughs> you were awesome because there was a couple of videos too and I, I i i love burlesque um i love that whole genre because it's basically all are welcome is why i love right. it so much they're you know different body types different people doesn't matter what gender you are it doesn't matter and i i always have loved that underground type vibe because I'm a very accepting person of everyone so I find that these little um, avant-garde uh, places or art forms they, they, they become so welcoming so the audience must have been so excited to have you there was it sold out? Yeah it was sold out it was a lot of Akhenaten fans which was really nice yeah. to connect with them again um, and yeah burlesque is really cool and I think there's a place for opera and burlesque and the circus arts all to combine and that's kind of what we went for that night 
it kind of felt like we were in 1920s Berlin doing oh. something naughty, but you know, people loved it. <laughs> Welcome in, come to the cabaret, yes. right? Oh, I love that. And yes. that room actually has that feel. I can totally see the MC coming out. Um, is there a dream role that you want to play? So you're going to do Sweeney, which is so exciting. Is this your first time playing Sweeney? Uh, you know, it's my second, but it's my first time professionally. That's amazing. I love that. But is there a role yeah. that you're like, I would love to play this role. I'm going to manifest this. It's happening in my lifetime. Whether it's opera, oh, musical yeah, theater. There's, there's so many. <laughs> I know. I, people ask me that, too, and I'm like, I can't even. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I, I would really love to play Votan in a full ring cycle. Um, I would love to play Boris Gudinov. Um, and... Uh, but, you know, my favorite thing is working on brand new pieces with composers. So my dream role, I would say, is yet to be written. I have used that line before. I say the same yeah. thing because I love new works, too. <laughs> There's nothing like putting your voice, your body language, your intention on a role that no one's that the, the words haven't even seeped from anyone's lips but your own first. I totally agree. Yeah. I get um, Kevin over here. He's we're working. He's writing a new musical that we're working on together. And we had a reading and oh, it was cool. so much fun. And I'm the same way. And I've said that my role hasn't been written yet. My dream role. So I love that. We're like we're kindred spirits here. Now, have you noticed totally. that you um, since you've been at the Met? Have you noticed an influx of people noticing you? Because we just had a whole conversation about social media, online presence. How has it been for you now? You're, uh, have yeah, you... it's been totally crazy. You know, I've always been big on social media and connecting with um, people there, and I really enjoy that. But the Met audience is just kind of ravenous to touch the process and to um, be connected to the artists that work there. And it's really exciting. Um so it's, it's definitely been pretty crazy. Um, like when we did the HD broadcast of Akhenaten around the world, I had like a few hundred direct messages in my Instagram just, you know, right after the show, just of people, strangers who saw it and wanted to send encouragement and love and, you know, express what it meant to them. And it's really touching. And um, it's, it's kind of been like that since we opened that show. It's been pretty crazy. <laughs> I um, I love the Met audience because when I started going, I will say it was a very specific type of audience member. I was always yep. the youngest one there um, because I, I it was how my aunt was. She was, you know, she had no children. Um, opera was her life. And it was like that type of vibe. I love that there's mm -hmm. this crossover and I'm seeing more young people appreciate the art of opera. So now as a performer, yes. I love how you mentioned, you know, that they're, you know, that they're ravenous. Has there been pushback from, well, I don't want to say older, from the more, um, what's a better word I can use, but, for, you know, from people that have had their season tickets maybe for like 50 years. How yeah, are they feeling about these newer operas? Be you know? Yeah, I mean, for Akhenaten, there were so many young people in the audience, mm -hmm. and that was the patrons that have been going to and supporting the Met for their whole lives mm -hmm. who are of an older demographic. I did hear many of them say, like, who are all these young people? Wow. But they were it was a positive thing. They were so excited to see so many young people in the audience appreciating something that they've appreciated their whole lives. And Akhenaten was pretty universally celebrated um, across audience demographics and that was um, it was really neat to see all of these people sharing a space and connecting for for a common purpose <laughs> supporting yes. you know supporting the same show um, so when I started going to the opera I'll never forget Porgy and Bess I was a little girl the curtain opens and there I am in the middle of Catfish Row so the Met was mm -hmm. always known for these elaborate lush sets I want to say maybe the past 10, even maybe 15 years, I have um, I did get to see A View from the Bridge uh, as an opera years ago at the Met, and the set was a little abstract. Has there been any, uh -huh. any uh, resp you know, where, let's say, the people that have been going to the opera since forever who want the sets and the costumes... How are they transitioning into, because I, the Met's now having more abstract sets, more abstract lighting. Right. I saw um, 
the one opera and the name's escaping me, where they had a puppet, a soldier puppet come on stage. So you're not feeling any pushback. You're feeling like they're starting to kind of transition into this new opera, which I think is exciting. And I personally think all these composers would be excited by it. Yeah, well, it shows, you know, here's the thing, is a lot of productions are coming into the Met from elsewhere, and a lot of times that's from Europe, where opera is more a part of people's lives, mm -hmm. and you grow up going to the opera. And so when, when it's part of your life like that, you are more open to more abstract interpretations, because maybe you've seen Madame Butterfly in 20 different productions in your life so you're open to interpretation and looking at it a different way mm -hmm. and that's not the case in the united states but the met is doing their part to push that and um, they still have many many huge traditional productions but they also have productions that challenge audiences to look at a piece in a different way and i think there's like both are important they are no i think it's important to honor tradition but i also think we can't live there i think there's a great marriage right. between tradition and um, progression is Peter Peter Gelb still he is right yes yeah, Peter yeah. Gelb. and he's the one I think that has been really shaking it up but I think it needed to happen Absolutely. because like you said this insurgence of people coming to the opera it's so exciting and you know my experience going to the Met I just love it I mean we would we would actually eat dinner at the Met like this is how hardcore my godmother was we would go early, we would have dinner, then we would have our dessert during the intermit. I mean, that's how hardcore opera we were. And I yeah. miss it. I miss going. I hope I get to see you in something. Um, can you give a little rundown on some of your upcoming performances and where they'll be? Sure, sure. I'm about to hit the road on a mini concert tour. So I'll be in Florida and Idaho and Iowa. Um, and then I am back to the operas. I'm doing a world premiere called Edward Tulane with Minnesota Opera. Um, and then I'll be in Milwaukee at Florentine Opera doing Macbeth. And then I'm spending the summer in Des Moines um, doing a Baroque opera called Plate. Um, and, of course, next season I'll be doing Sweeney Todd at Opera Omaha and some other things that are yet to be announced. Uh, do you have anything coming in to New oh into into oh sorry we, we're having a squall warning here in uh oh. in, in new in good old jersey um do you have um oh i just got distracted uh so wait you live in philly i love philadelphia yeah. i've been spending more time yeah, there awesome. talk you know to me philly is like becoming like i don't want to say like a new new york but the art scene there is pretty it's like art and history which i love what's it like living in philly and then when you come to new uh, york what's favorite cities in the entire world yeah and i've wanted to live here forever um i've done a lot of work with opera philadelphia and the philadelphia orchestra and so from those experiences i kind of developed the desire to want to live here and finally took the plunge but it's a great place to be it's a wonderful world-class city and the art scene is terrific and also you know i can get to new york in an hour and 10 minutes so it's perfect for me that's what i going to ask you i, I mean i imagine it's so what like you just take the train i mean that's amazing yeah, the Amtrak is wonderful. Oh my God, you gotta love, you know, you know, little uh, lighten up your carbon footprint by taking, by taking mass transit. Yeah. So, are you going to be in New York anytime soon, doing any little ancillary, like you know, smaller projects that are that um, anyone can come and see, or are you? Yeah. That you just can't yeah, announce I'm yet. Doing, um, <laughs> so I'm doing. I don't know the full details, but I'm doing an art installation in April oh. um, with the great artist Jamie Warren. Um, and I'll definitely um, keep the social media world posted about that. I'm also doing a Beethoven 9, which I'm very excited about, with the uh, uh, Southern New Jersey Philharmonic in Ooh. Voorhees, New Jersey in April. So, Oh, let me know, because I, could, I would love to actually meet you um, and yeah. sit down and talk to you face to face, because I do. I have to say, you have wonderful posts on Facebook. Um, you're very positive, you. you're very enlightening, and, and I think you're, you're very inspiring, which is what kind of Thanks. drew me to you. There's definitely this, you have this magic quality um, to you, and I, 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 this is just the, the stepping point for you. I definitely think that we're, the world's going to hear more of uh, Zachary James. Did you ever think this would happen for you? This uh, amount of uh, um, I don't know. I know, I'm it's such a sure mundane question. but it's been a dream of mine to 
you know, be in music full time and to be an artist my whole life. So I'm very grateful and humbled. Can, do you mind if I ask you what you did before you were doing this full time? What was your day job essentially while you were you were pursuing your career in music? Yeah, I mean, it happened pretty quickly for me. So I haven't, I didn't really ever have much of a day job period, but there were a couple short chapters chapters where I worked as an administrative assistant or executive assistant for mm-hmm. some important people in different industries. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that experience and it actually helped me be a better business person in showbiz and it helped me to be better organized myself with my own feelings. So it was a pretty valuable experience. I love that you say that because I say my, I don't regret anything in, in my life. I really don't. I love where my life has landed, no. but I wish I took a business class when I was in college, because that's the hard part, yeah. I think, for an artist, because we're so artsy, right? We, we act, we yep. do all this. <laughs> but to become that organized and a little bit, and I love that you mentioned that, being more organized, being more business savvy. I feel like a business yeah. class should be required for all actors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really, because you're kind of, you are running a business and you're the CEO, you're the mm-hmm. HR department, you're the marketing department, you're everything for mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's really important to have a basic understanding of all of those areas. So I want to mention, um, this is so random, but you had a post on social media, on Facebook, with some great bags. Can you talk about these awesome oh, yeah. backpacks? Because they're real, I was like, I kind of want one. <laughs> Oh, you should get one. Yeah, so that's my boyfriend, Sam. He makes those in our home. We, we each have our own studios in our home, and he has a, a sewing studio, and I have my music studio. <laughs> those bags were – and what and you know what? I love that you're, you were the model, of course, and those bags are beautiful. <laughs> um, are, they avail, and are they available for – they're available for purchase. Do you want to plug him really quick? Yeah, yeah. So um, best way to find him is at SR Bag Design on Instagram. Um, and I think it's also srbagdesign.com. But yeah, the interesting thing about him, so he, for a living, he does autopsies. and Oh my, <laughs> so, God. he's a good sewer. <laughs> yeah. So he does hospital autopsies at U10, and then he comes home and sews handbags. He's a very interesting person. <laughs> I absolutely love that story. I think that's amazing. And I bet you his sewing skills are on point. They're really good because he sews up human bodies for a living. I mean, yeah. if you could sew up a human body, you could sew a bag. And I promise you, listeners, those bags are amazing. I'm gonna, So I'm going to have to go check that out because I seriously want yeah. one of those bags. And I like those bags because, again, it, they're unisex. Yeah, they are. His whole line is unisex, and um, and they're really beautiful and really well made. I carry one myself every day and oh really enjoy it. What a great way to, you know, because as artists, I feel like we all live in a bag, don't we? All our stuff goes Yeah, we have to. to, and that's what I said to him. I was like, I need a bag that carries, like, three <laughs> opera scores, magician binder, and a water bottle. What can you do, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, he's like, let me just do this. Bam, bam, he comes out of the room, he has a bag. So th- I, I had to mention yeah. the bag, so I definitely wanted to plug them. But now plug yourself. Where can our listeners find you on social media, website, all over? Where can they find you? Sure, yeah. I'm at ZachJames.com, and you can find me there and message me there. And I'm also um, on Instagram at uh, Zachary James. Just search me. And uh, Twitter as well. And all those social links are also on my website, ZachJames.com. So uh, come come on by. It's me at my website and my social media. It's never like someone working for me. It's always me. And I, I really love connecting with people on those platforms. And I will vouch for him that it is him. And you are very responsive. You are very oh, responsive. You know, very, very. I mean, obviously, if you're in a show, you're not, you know, sitting there texting. But he does get back to you because I've been, like, needling you. I'm like, hi, I want to interview you. Hi. And then I finally, I think I messaged you. Or, no, I, you messaged me. And I was like, let's set it up. Let's set it up for January. Yeah. And I have been very excited about this. You know, as a girl that grew up going to the opera, I don't have a lot of people to talk to it about, you know, to talk to it about the experience of being at the opera because, you know, you get a lot of people that say it's, oh, it's boring. I'm like, no, I'm like, it's not though. And that's why I love that, that Peter Gelb is shaking things up a little bit. And I love the Uh new young faces that are going to the Met. It's so important. And this art form needs to live on. 
It's incredibly important. And so I was actually just named um, an ambassador for yes. Opera America, which is the service organization yes. in North America for opera. And so, you know, I was already doing this work, but I take it really seriously that as an opera professional, part of my job is to make the art form more accessible mm-hmm. and to break down the mysteries surrounding it because there's a lot of stereotypes that keep people away from Ugh, opera. It's so annoying. Um, You're so right. Yeah. And my major tools for doing that besides you know, connecting with people when I'm performing is uh, social media Mm -hmm. and connecting with people there and answering questions about, you know, productions I'm in or what it is to be a singer. It's very important. I agree. I agree. And I think you do everything with such grace and aplomb. And I have been an admirer of you for a long time. And it's funny how Facebook will I think like one day you just like popped up in my feed. I, I mean, one I, pr- I probably friend requested you or something. And then all of a sudden you were like popping up and and I was falling down the Zachary James rabbit hole. I was looking at the opera <laughs> and I was looking at the pictures and I was I was like, oh, my gosh, I, I have to get this man because um, there's a lot more to you, which is what I love about your social media. Um, you're pretty uh, you're authentic. And after talking to you now, what? What I'm getting now is exactly what we get on social media, and I think that's what I love about you so much. Well, thanks. That really means a lot to me. No, I'm so glad that you you came on my show today. Um, you have so many wonderful things going for you, and I cannot wait to see what what's next up your sleeve. I'm sure you're going to surprise us with something. You always I have try, a surprise in we'll store, see. Zachary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Well, Thanks for reaching out and for taking the time to talk. Oh, thank you. And, um, you know, we'll connect like the next time you're in New York or if I live in New Jersey, you know, if you're in New Jersey and I know that you're very busy and I know that I know the artist's life is like sometimes you get an hour here, an hour there. But I could sure. come and meet you. I would love to just sit down and chat with you, um, you know, off the record, just hang out and get to know you. And uh, but I'm here supporting you. So thank you so much, Zachary, for coming on today. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting you in person. Definitely. Have a great day, and don't get stuck in that squall. (laughs) I shall not. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, Zachary. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. So we were just talking to Zachary James. You can go uh, follow him on the social media, Zachary James. Uh, I think it's either Zach James or ZacharyJames.com. His website is amazing. He is so engaging on social media, such a sweetheart. I love talking to him. Uh, Kevin, do you want anything you want to add before we go? No. Um, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. <laughs> no, I'm in. good. You're good. Um, we had a lot going on today, but I can speak for Kevin, and I could also speak for Danny, who is not here. Uh, we're all pretty ready to jump into 2020 head first. We, ha- we all have some new and exciting projects. And, you know, with every setback, like, I had a setback a little bit. Um, I'm not going to let that derail me. It did It did derail me for um, a little while. But now that I was able to expel everything that I was feeling to everyone, uh, I am back and ready to move forward. I have a lot of projects that I'm going to slowly be um, announcing to you. And listen, we always say, if you have a story to tell or if you have something you're pro- promoting, shoot me an email, lomomillsnj.com. No, yes, lomomillsnj at, gmail, lomomillsnj at gmail.com. Say, hey, listen, I have this going on. Do you mind giving me a shout-out on your show? I will do it. That's what the, that is what the purpose of the show is from day one. So don't be afraid to reach out to me. You might have to um, nudge me a little bit because I do – this sounds like – I get a lot of texts and all day, but I do. I get a lot of texts. I get a lot of emails. Really quick, I want to plug. I am directing a one act called Bum Deal, written by Gabrielle um, Wagner and Gabrielle Wagner Man, and we are doing appointment only auditions on Saturday. It's with the Theater Project, the last weekend in February. Super fun show. Gabby's amazing. You all know me. Um, it's a two men, one woman, one act. If you're interested in auditioning, shoot me an email, shoot me a DM, shoot me a text, and we'll get you an appointment. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We will we'll be back next week with author Eileen Angel um, to talk about the new book that she wrote. Good stuff happening here. Thanks for chewing with us today. Peace out.